The next speaker is Keith, Keith Jerome, um, who will be talking about uh, in vivo gene editing for herpes simplex virus cure. So I was excited the organizers uh, had the thought of doing <laughs> other, uh, other systems because uh, I, I do some of that myself. Um, so I'm going to start right off with the community summary. And the, the basic question is, can we use gene editing, uh, kind of like you heard about this morning from Trish uh, about for, for HIV, can we use that for other lifelong viral infections? And the, and the answer is yes. And so we'll show you that we can achieve um, the near total elimination of latent herpes simplex virus from, from certain reservoir sites in, in latently infected mice. And I think this is important because uh, just like we want to learn from the oncologists, we can learn from other viral infections as well. And I'll give you some examples of how the HIV work has really helped us uh, as we move forward. And then I'll make the point um, that you'll hear a lot tomorrow that the major driver for success in almost any of the approaches that we're talking about is delivery of our, uh, of, of our genetic payload, whatever it is. A uh, couple of disclosures. So let's do a little bit of biology about herpes simplex, since this is an HIV group. So this is a big virus, a big double-stranded DNA virus, about 150,000 base pairs, and lots of people have this in the United States. Uh, uh, probably over half of people have HSV-1, and 12% or so have HSV-2. Now, herpes establishes latency, much like we think about for HIV, but instead of um, in memory T cells, herpes establishes latency within nerve bodies within ganglia. So uh, for HSV-1, it's typically the trigeminal ganglion or the superior cervical ganglion. For HSV-2, it would be the dorsal root ganglion. And the virus reactivates periodically from these sites, um, basically comes back down the axon, goes back out to the peripheral site and establishes a lesion, transmits to, to new people. Uh, and people who are infected have very different experiences with this virus. Lots of people don't know they're infected. Lots, and, and other people have severe frequent recurrences. And at least for a subset of affected people, it really matters and it affects their lives. Um, and and uh, because I used to have to make the case that this was important and worth working on, I would put up this point, is that the last year that acyclovir was on patent, so that the drug companies could, could charge a fair bit for it, um, people spent $1.4 billion on it, despite the fact that that's actually not a very good drug for treating recurrences. It's not all that effective. So people cared. So let's talk a little bit about HSV latency. I mentioned that that is, that occurs in sensory and autonomic ganglia. Um, but I like this as a target for gene editing because unlike HIV, where I say, gosh, it's all over the place, it's, it seems like it's going to be a challenge to get into all the lymphoid tissue and everywhere. In herpes, we know exactly where it is, and there aren't that many cells. So I mentioned a couple of different types of ganglia could be in, and each ganglion has, just to make it easy, you can think of 10,000 neurons in it. Might be 20,000, might be 30,000, but it's, you know, it's not 10 to the sixth or 10 to the seventh. It's, it's tens of thousands. And each ganglion um, has a mixture of herpes infected and uninfected neurons, maybe 10% are infected, and each one of those has about 10 copies. So you can see that all the clinical disease that we're talking about, it's not actually coming from a mass, it's a very finite thing we're trying to affect. And in fact, um, a number of studies show that the frequency and probably severity of recurrences actually is a function of reservoir size. So there's a lot of analogies to what we're doing in this room but maybe a little bit of an easier target for us to attack. Um, okay, so um, you know, all these things make me say, maybe we can, we can gene edit this. So you know, I, as I mentioned, I used to use this quote about how much money people spent, but I got tired of trying to convince reviewers that this was worth doing. Um, so we actually did a study, and I got together with Anna Wald and, and Linda Say So, um, that was patterned a lot after the community work that's happened in the HIV field, where you simply ask people, what do you think about cure? Does it matter? Is it worth doing? Um, and if so, what would you care, you know, what appeals to you? And basically anything we could think of to, to write there, people said, yeah, that's, you know, that's desirable, some level of de desirable. And in fact, 95% of people said, well, you know, if, if I wouldn't pass this to, to a newborn child or a partner, they think this is a great idea. So people actually care about this, and they're also willing to participate in trials. And, and so this, you know, if you changed one letter on this, it would look a lot like what we're seeing about HIV, basically. Um, and, and, you know, generally, people are understanding that, that you know, our, our mission is to, to promote health, and, and this is a way that we can do this. 
So what are we doing? We're doing gene editing. Um, and one point I like to make the audience is gene editing does not equal CRISPR-Cas, okay? <laughs> CRISPR-Cas is a tool. You know, you have a Phillips head screwdriver in your toolbox, but you might have a flathead too, right? And, and there might be certain situations where the flathead's better, right? And, and I'm gonna show you why this class, the meganucleases that we talked about just a little at the beginning of the day, um, might be the right tool for the job here. So we've been collaborating for a long time with a company called Selectus out of Paris. Um, it, it, they designed two HSV-specific uh, meganucleases, one called M5 and M8. These target some of the clearly essential genes of, of HSV. So if you knock these out, the virus can't replicate, even in culture. We have some control enzymes and so forth. And so, you know, it's like Cas9. We find a long sequence, in this case a herpes virus sequence. If the enzyme sees it, it makes a double strand break, and then we see what happens, okay? And we all know you can get mutation, whatever else. So, so we're gonna try to at least damage this virus so that it can't cause problems. So uh, Martino Barron in the lab, who's, who's been working with me for, for a very long time now, uh, uh, about five years ago, um, published that these enzymes worked in a culture system. I won't go through the data, but if you create an in vivo or an in vitro system of HSV latency, um, the enzyme can, can go in and cleave them. And so that was all wonderful. But the question was, how do you move this into something that's happening in vivo? How do you, you know, move into an animal and, and hopefully someday into a human being? And so we established a mouse model of latent herpes virus infection. And it actually compared to all the models we've talked about today. This is actually really pretty simple. So uh, you take a, a typical outbred mouse. We use Swiss Webster mice. You can use other strains as well. Um, you put herpes on the eye, basically. They get a little infection, they get, they get uh, you know, ulceration. That heals up after a week or two. The mice are fine. But in the meantime, the virus has gone down the axon, gone down to their superior cervical ganglia, their trigeminal ganglion establishes latency. Okay, and latency looks just like any human being. The only thing about these mice, they don't spontaneously reactivate, so they don't have spontaneous recurrences. But everything else about latency is the same. And so we wanted to uh, essentially deliver our meganuclease, and we chose to use AAV at the time because we knew that AAV can actually ride the same molecular motors that herpes uses to go up and down the axon, okay? So we thought that might be a good way. We actually put it kind of onto the mouse face, into the whisker pad and subdermal. Turns out we were making it unnecessarily complex, but that's what we were doing at the time. We talked a little bit about AAV. You hear a lot about AAV tomorrow. Um, but I'm going to go into some nuances of that in a second. Um, but if we did that, um, this, was, th this paper that Martin published in 2016 was actually, I think, the first demonstration of in vivo gene editing of an established viral infection. So, so you know, we had ident the field identified you could do gene editing in animals, but to actually infect an animal with something and then go in and edit it, she did that. Um, so that was great news. Uh, the bad news was, if you looked at how much herpes you were actually editing, it was about 4%. Okay, so wonderful, you know, I get to say it, it's the first demonstration, blah, 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 but it's 4%. That's not really going to matter. And so what I'll talk with you about in the last 10 minutes is essentially the work that we've done over the past three or so years, trying to get from 4% in, up to something that's actually meaningful. All right, so first of all, let's get a little bit deeper into AAV. Um, so AAV um, exists in nature as, as essentially mostly a single-stranded DNA virus. So it's got two genes in here, um, and then these inverted terminal repeats that go on the end. And that, and so that's the whole genome. And, and essentially, if you want to use this as a gene therapy vector, you just take out those two viral genes, you put in whatever you're interested in uh, through some clever trans complementation things, you, you allow it to package up, and now you have a gene delivery vector. So this is great, but when this goes into a cell, it needs to be a double-stranded piece of DNA to express itself. So one of two things can happen. Cellular processes can synthesize the second strand, make this come out, or if two of these find each other, they can sort of bind to each other and you get something like this, but, but that's now comp complemented, so you can get gene expression. This is great, it'll hold about four, 0.8 KB of transgene, um, which works very well. And in fact, most of what you heard is using that system. 
But if you have a small payload, you can do a little trick. And basically, you can put your payload kind of in a palindrome, kind of one half in this direction, one half in this direction. And when it goes in, it basically folds back on itself. And this can happen almost instantly. So as soon as the cell hits, the, the, the vector hits the cell, it starts to express, OK? So you have very rapid expression and very high level expression. We call these self-complementary AAV. And so um, why this is important is if you do CRISPR-Cas, even the small ones like uh, Staph aureus, it kind of barely fits in there, OK? But meganucleases are nice and small, so I can do this. It means I can make gene editing enzymes exist at very high levels, OK? And this just shows if I'm trying to deliver these things, um, uh, uh, in this case, just a transgene, a marker transgene via a single-stranded AV versus a self-complementary at the same dose. This is a trigeminal ganglion. The dark things are neurons. You can tell because they're stained. Here's the transgene. You can see a lot of transgene that co-localizes with the neurons with the self-complementary here at 56 days. But there's really not much expression from the single stranded. And, and you know, we, weren't, we weren't the first person, people to describe this, but, but we have made a, uh, uh, use of this for gene editing. OK, so um, what happens if you take this self-complementary approach now and, and test things? And so here we simply took our mouse model, uh, let latency establish itself, put in our AAV. In this case, it's uh, self-complementary with our same meganucleases that got 4% before. Did the same sort of test. And you know, in the very first experiment, we doubled efficiency. OK, so now 4 to 8, probably still not the sorts of, of places we want to be. Um, but then you start to play all the tricks of AAV. So you'll hear more about this tomorrow. But AAV exists in different serotypes. They basically have their capsids are slightly different. So they bind different cellular receptors. Or if they get into the cell, they, they access the nucleus and express different efficiencies. So a whole bunch of them you can just try. You go through this empirically. Unfortunately, you can do screens. You find which one works the best. But if we start to do that, and we really optimize these, looking at routes of infection, various serotypes, and so forth, and really study them, um, we start to see much higher um, gene editing frequencies. So now, by next generation sequencing, under some of our situations, we can now get up to 30% of our virus gene edited. OK. Now, one thing we'd done before when we were at 4% is we'd asked, how often do we damage the virus? So we get this indel you know, at the site we're targeting. Does the virus repair or does it go away? And at 4%, we can't see anything go away. Even we do this by really precise digital PCR, you can't tell. But what happens if we do that by um, now with 30%, does that start to mean something? And in fact, now if we do this by digital PCR, and you look in the superior cervical ganglion of our treated animals, for the first time we see a statistically significant decrease in the viral load in those ganglia, OK? And it's, in this experiment, it's about 75%. OK, so now the virus is going down. And then we got a clever idea from the HIV field. It was actually from Kamel's lab um, that was targeting LTR, you know, targeting the LTR. And what they found was you get excision, right? Um, that makes sense. You've cleaved both LTRs. But in fact, excision happened more frequently than getting mutations at each site, as if excision is favored. So we said, well, what happens if we target herpes in two places? I'll just make two AAVs. They're exactly the same, except there's two enzymes targeting the virus in two places. And in fact, if you do that, you start to see that you get um, even more robust loss of virus. Um, and in fact, now not only in the superior cervical ganglion, but now also in the trigeminal ganglion, which uh, it, it, to steal my own thunder a little bit, is often a, a more difficult target for us to get in. So you can start to play lots of, of games with all this, but I can tell you that reproducibly now we're getting rid of over 90% of, of the virus um, within uh, particularly the, the superior cervical ganglion. Uh, here's, here, uh, let's see, what's a nice example of that? You know, here we, we're seeing a lot. And this, and this actually matters because, you know, getting rid of the ganglionic load is really important. But what, hap what about reactivation, right? Does this matter? So you can force the virus to reactivate. And what you see is a 90% reduction in the reservoir is actually magnified when you try to make the virus reactivate. So you see about a 95% reduction in virus that reactivates, that can come out. We're now doing this in vivo and actually looking at shedding uh, in the eye, and this is a proxy for transmission in a human being. So we're really excited about that work. All right. So why are we at 90%? You know, I'd love to be at 100. Why are we at 90% uh, in the SCG? And why are we at 50% or so at best, maybe in the TG? 
And one thing we started to think about is this delivery issue. You know, a trigeminal ganglion, not every cell, not every neuron in that ganglion is the same, and it's very different from the SCG. One is a sensory ganglion, one is an autonomic ganglion, so are they different? So we did a single cell analysis of this, I won't go, th I think people generally know how that works. So the experiment was simply to put in a number of different AAV types into experimental mice, they're all quote, barcoded, in this case with different fluorophores, and we just ask, what kind of cells do they go into, okay? So, so you know, d does one AAV do better for one type, and, 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 you know, and maybe one matches up better with herpes, who knows? And if you do that, the first thing that falls out is you get transcriptional patterns of the neurons within these ganglia. So you get uh, sets of cells. So this is in the TG. There's a much bigger diversity of cells within the TG. The superior cervical ganglia is more uniform, but they're completely different. So they're neurons. And in, in fact, uh, one, one cluster here is T cells. I think it might be that one. A few fell through our purification. So, you know, they're neurons, but they're very different. And if you look at where herpes is, and particularly where AAV is, they're non-randomly distributed through those different or through those different neuronal subsets. So it starts to say maybe there is some difference that, you know, we think about T effector memory or central memory, right? We worry about that. The same thing's happening in these ganglia. Um, but it's single cell, so you can actually look at this single cell level, right? And fortunately, herpes makes one transcript called LAT, and so you can identify um, which neurons have herpes in them, um, and, and so that's shown by the green, um, and then you can look at which ones have AAV. Um, so look how, look how well like AAV8 goes into the uh, superior cervical ganglia. No wonder this works so well for gene editing. But then we can look at the overlay of those, and you can see in the SCG we're getting about 80% you know, overlap, right? And this sort of correlates with this, you know, in, a, in the ballpark of the same sort of gene editing frequencies that I'm seeing. All right, so we've done a lot of work. So that would, that would tell us that maybe since there's these subsets, there is no one perfect AAV for this, right? So it makes a prediction that maybe we need combinations, particularly to get to the SCG. So Martine did a great experiment. We took three of our best um, trigeminal ganglia serotypes. So let's try each one. Let's try combinations of two, and let's try all three. And can we cover things more? And it's always very hard to see a loss of genomes in the trigeminal ganglion, particularly if you only use one enzyme, okay? So we're, we're stacking the deck against ourselves here. We're not gonna use this two and all this. We just use one. And in fact, what you see is, you know, with very big experimental groups, it starts to look like we're getting, uh, getting loss of genomes here. Um, you know, by 52%, 30%, but none of that reaches significance. I think it's 12 animals per group. Uh, you know, trend, 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 but finally when we get to three, we see the, the biggest result, and it also happens to achieve statistical significance. So I think the, the lesson here is delivery may not, we may not have a single answer for what we're trying to, to accomplish, and that may be true for HIV as well. Um, so, you know, we can do this, you can eliminate virus, uh, and I think single cell analysis is gonna be an incredibly powerful tool for really optimizing this sort of approach for whatever we wanna do. Um, you can read this, everybody did the work, um, and thank you very much. Great, any questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I can't go through, I didn't have, yeah, obviously, time to do all that. So we don't see any inflammation, no, no neuronal loss, no behavioral problems in the mice, perfectly tolerated. Um, we haven't seen genetic lesions, so it looks safe. Yes, it's forever, which is also kind of good because whatever genomes are left over, if they do try to make new copies, those are not chromatinized and they're easy targets. They get destroyed instantly. Yeah. Trish. Um, so my question is with the last experiment when you were using multiple AAVs, right. and this is something that we, we get a lot when they say, you know, if you're going to use multiple AAVs or multiple doses, what about, you know, the immune response? What about, you know, AAV antibodies um, for, you know, are you doing them all at, at one time or did you do them Yeah, these go all or? at once. So we've done every permutation of that. So if you take, you know, an AAV1, 
you know, with one color, try to come in two weeks, you, you can't do it. You generate an immune response and you, sure. you don't get expression. You can change the serotype and get it. So these go in all at once. We've also played in macaque studies for HIV with immunosuppression. There are, there are ways to get around that. Sure. I don't think it's a killer problem overall, but okay. we'd rather make it easy. Okay, thanks. Yes. They're reducing the dose of the individuals. Yeah. So I'm wondering why you wanted to hold the dose to a certain level. Why don't you just add them? And, um, and does, how, what if you account for that difference in the data? What does it look like? Uh, yeah, you know, we went round and round in lab meetings about that. You know, there are people who feel strongly both ways. It's how we chose to do it, total dose. Um, in a practical sense, it was initially limited by ACRC, like what we had proposed we could do. Um, you know, they are delivering the same enzyme, but you're right that, that an individual cell, you might think would get less. We don't have evidence for that, though, so, so I don't have a direct answer. Okay. Thank All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah.